Hello and welcome back to my renovation vlog. This is week 14. Uh, today's date is April 15th and I've got some great updates for you. Um, if we haven't met yet, my name is Karen McMillan and I am completely planning, designing and managing my own home renovation, not hiring a GC and doing it all myself. So it's really, really exciting. I try to do updates every Monday, although the past couple I've had to skip. So I'm doing sort of every other week right now. But this week I've got some great updates in terms of my fireplace, my budget and specifically on some structural updates. So let's go ahead and dive into those. OK, so first things first. Uh, just an update on my budget. My husband and I finally had an official set down where we went through the budget that I've been managing line by line to figure out where we want to spend and where we want to cut. See, part of the problem is that I apparently have very expensive tastes and I want to include everything in the reno and we just can't afford to include everything that I want, which is unfortunate, of course, but you know, everybody's got their budget and ours is not that big. So <laughs> we've had to make some cuts. But up until this weekend, I've just sort of been having everything in my budget and looking at this very overinflated number that we couldn't afford. Um, but I wasn't sure yet where his priorities lay and we, you know where mine were and what I was prepared to cut. So we had to go through it and figure that out together. And because that's only something that you can do, those are joint discussions that you have to have, right? So that's why I had everything in the budget because I just wanted to get pricing on everything. And then we had to go through and make some tough decisions. So. Um, one of the things that we had to get rid of, at least for now, is the fireplace. And I'm kind of gutted by it because I really love a fireplace. Um, but to be fair, the fireplace did have some issues. So first of all, it was going to be expensive. So just to get the fireplace that I was looking for, I really, um, I think I'm the last one I was talking about, how I really want this big, huge fireplace. And one of the issues is that A, they get very expensive because of the sheer size of it. Um, it they're, they're just big, they're heavy to install. Uh, my general design style is going to be quite modern and minimalistic. And so it, it was going to be a linear fireplace and it was just going to be really big because that's what I want. If I'm going to have an installed built-in fireplace, I want it to be this big focal point. But it was getting to be really expensive. It was going to be, I think, $12,000 just to just to get it installed, like for the product and installation. And then I'd have to also build the surround on top of that and then have some sort of finishing products like tiles, I don't know, mantle, whatever I was going to do. And so, you know, it was going to look like $15,000. And so we had the discussion and we said, okay, maybe that's something that we hold off on. Part of the reason is because in order to get um, one of these big fireplaces, they just automatically come with a huge amount of BTUs, right? Which is the heat that comes off of these fireplaces. They're amazing products. The technology is fantastic. But our home is not that big. And so the feedback that I was getting from the, the fireplace guys is that these, you know, the ones that I really liked were sort of borderline too much for the house. And what would happen, what we were sort of scared of happening is that we would turn them on for a few minutes and then be like, oh, it's too hot in here and we're going to turn them off. And then what's the point of having it if you never turn it on and you can't just turn them down. They're kind of on or off. Some of them you can turn down a bit, but they're still like they're really powerful. So, you know, the fireplace guys are suggesting smaller units to me. And just my personal preference on that is some of the, the smaller ones. Yes, they have smaller heat output and they're smaller frames, but they've got these big, ugly frames on them and they're just not as attractive. And the actual flame units are really small and the little, the, 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 um, wood or whatever it is, they just look small and kind of chintzy. And I just, I, I couldn't get, I couldn't get on board with it. So I said, all right, let's, let's nix the fireplace for now. And what the solution that I have in my head, which actually makes a lot more sense for our space and our situation is a freestanding unit. So I've been researching those and I think that there's, I found a, um, two really great ones that I'm really excited about. One I'm going to go see in the store next week. They're hooking it up with the gas. So I'm going to go check that out. And um, that's the Yodel, Yodel unit, J-O-T-U-L. And it's a freestanding unit and it's really, really cool. Um, and then Valor makes another one. So I'm looking at both of those. And the great thing about both of those units is that they don't need a big installation. They still need to be installed, obviously, and hooked up to the gas and the venting. But we've already got the gas line there just because this is of where it's going to go is where our old gas stove is. Like it's the, the layout's moving, so the gas stove is moving. So we've got the gas hookup already and the old hole through the brick is already there because that's where the vent was, the hood vent. 
So the great thing is we don't have to do anything right now. Um, if I if the, the gas stove hadn't been there, then I would definitely be roughing in the gas line and the exhaust vent hole. I would do those now as part of this reno and just hold off on buying the unit. But as it is, we've got those in, so we can just hold off. And because they're freestanding units, we can install them at any point later down the road and there's no negative impact. That's one of the biggest things, right? Is you don't wanna have to do rework when you're going through this process of what to include and what to cut. You always wanna make sure that you're, you're including things in the reno that you don't have to undo later. So that's why the fireplace was the easiest one. Um, but also it just makes sense to have one of these freestanding units because the BTUs are slightly smaller and um, and then they're just not going to be such a, a huge focal point, but they're going to be really cool and I can still cozy up next to it and, and it won't be overwhelming the space. So it's kind of a win-win and it means we're going to spend less on the actual unit because they're smaller and easier to install. So the cost is going down. I don't need to do it right away. So you know, even though we're not going to save the whole amount of money overall, because I will do it down the road, I don't need to put it in this budget. So I can wait until I save a bit more money and therefore don't go into as much debt. <laughs> Just let me be clear. This is costing us money and we are going into debt for this right now. We, I don't have this much cash on hand. So <laughs> I am very cost conscious, but I just want everything also at the same time. So it's very difficult. Okay. So that's the fireplace. Now I know it might be, there might be some questions out there saying, okay, but like you're trying to start construction in, you know, under two months, what are you doing making layout changes right now? And that is fair. That is very fair, but it's okay because of what I've explained about how this doesn't have negative impacts to anything else, right? So um, the rest of my layout doesn't have to get updated and um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just not, it doesn't have any big major implications. It's not affecting other parts of the, the reno or the, the layout or anything like that. It's just something I'm, I'm taking away from the scope versus adding in and nothing else is changing. So it's totally fine. And that's how it goes, right? And I'm still planning. At the end of the day, I'm still in planning mode. I have not actually committed to anything except for my back door. Um, and I bought some, some vents, some hair <laughs> registers the other day because there was a big sale on, so I bought those. But otherwise I haven't spent anything. So we're still in the planning phase and it's okay to make changes in the planning phase because they're still free, so that's great. The next thing that I wanted to talk about, so I talked about budget, I talked about the fireplace. Okay, so structure, Whew, talking about budget, structure. I finally got at the end of, just before, I don't know when it was, a week and a half ago, whatever it was, I finally got my plans back from the architect who had gotten them approved by the structural engineer. And so I was very excited about that. So I immediately was able to share those plans with a few different structural companies that I had reached out to to get quotes. And then it took them a few days to come and see the house and review the plans and get the estimates. And woof, that was, uh, getting those estimates back was a bit of a punch to the gut. So my uh, ballpark budget in my in my budget was 45,000. And both the estimates that I got back, they were within $3,000 of each other. They were both in the uh, mid 70,000. So one was 73,000 and the other was 76,000. And so, <laughs> ouch, yeah, that was, a, it was a lot. It was a lot, but, um, you know, it's fine. And here's why. So the, uh, initially I was quite shocked and, you know, you, you go through the doom and gloom of, oh, I can't afford anything. This whole, should we cancel the whole project? You know, just all of those, those thoughts that are so normal and they come up all the time. But then, you know, you calm down, the rational brain kicks in and you say, okay, what is this quote based on? What can we do? What's the next step? So I reached out um, to the guys that I spoke to and I said, look, let's, let's, let's have a chat about this because we're going to need to find us another solution here. I can't just cancel the project, but I also don't have this much in the budget. What can we do here to, to make something happen? Um, and, and it's important to, that I specify, I was not asking for a breakdown of exactly what they, you know, where the money was, was it in their labor? Was it in materials, anything like that? Um, and I definitely did not ask them to just reduce their costs because their costs are built on the scope that I provided to them, right? I gave them the plans and they're just mirroring that back and saying, here's the plans that you asked for and here's the cost to do the structure that is outlined in those plans, right? Because the plans incorporated the structural dimensions of like this steel beam needs to be this big and it needs to be this gauge metal and it needs to be attached to this type of post by this type of bracket and it's blah, blah, like it was very specific. That's what you're getting from a structural engineer is 
specific instructions for how to replace load bearing walls. And you do not want to mess around with that. So it was not my place to say, well, do we really need this one? Or how can we avoid this? But we did find some solutions. And the first one is actually one that I noticed myself. Once I was looking at the plans in a little bit more detail, I noticed that the um, the architect or the structural engineer, whoever it was, where they had drawn in a beam, and I, you know what, I'll show this to you on the screen, just a second, and then I'm gonna pull it up here. Okay, so I've got my plans up. You may have seen these before in a previous video. So this was the the, the, the configuration of, of beams that I assumed would have to happen. So um, one across here to replace this load bearing wall. So this one on the left is my current footprint with the current walls and everything. So I would, I knew this was load bearing and I needed to get a beam across here. I also needed this one to go down here. And then I had just assumed that they might want to break up through conversations that I had with the architect, um, that they would want to put another beam through here and then another one through here. So basically this wall, this whole wall here would be replaced by load bearing wall or by beam because it's all load bearing and this one here. So, so I got something back that was very similar. So what I got back was obviously this one because this is a big opening. So that needed a steel beam to hold both, um, you know, the structure above as well as the bricks. So that needed to be steel. I also, they sent back one, a beam here going from that to here. And then they, this was all per expectations, the rest of it here. And obviously I had her here over the new window. That was all fine. But the interesting thing that they did, which I, you know, I'm not sure why they did it this way, but for whatever reason, this beam here that I'm, I'm mousing over this back beam, which I knew had to be there for some reason, they put it so that the edge of the beam, the end, the end of it rather would be resting right on this window in the basement. Sorry, I should specify. This is the basement layout underneath. So they put the beam to be resting right here on this window. So what did that mean? All of a sudden it meant that we had to reinforce the structure around this window because right now there's just just the stru just enough structure to hold up, you know, that side of the house and all the regular load. But if you all of a sudden take all of the load that's been stretched across the middle of the house and start putting it all on that one beam that's going through there, then this whatever's on top of this window now supporting it is no longer strong enough. So what they were, were, were requiring was for me to replace the header above this window with steel, a much, or maybe there's steel down there now, I don't know, but like a bigger steel, and then um, another post sort of down in this wall here so to support that so that the weight would go down, hit the steel above the window, go all over to both sides and down. And so um, this would have required me to do all of this work now in the basement, which is where we're planning to live during this whole renovation process. That's right there is where <laughs> I'm gonna have to be sleeping during the construction phase. And so all of a sudden we're gonna have to rip out the walls. We're gonna have to do all this work down here and then redo all the work like to drywall and finishing it while we're living down there. So it's going to be a pain in the butt as well as extra fees that we didn't expect to have to do rework down there just to have this post there instead of saying, well, why don't we just move that beam? So that's what I went back to the architect and I said, well, why does this beam have to be exactly here? I know this is the load bearing wall, but I also know that you can have, you can have beams or load bearing walls up to two feet, at least in our building code. I don't know what it is like for everywhere, but you can have um, load bearing structures within two feet of other structure underneath. So there's no reason it had to be here. And actually they had this um, lower down, they had it further this way um, by about a foot and a half or a foot, I'm not sure. And that's why it was resting on the window instead of just moving it to where I have it drawn or even further back. So I went back to them and I said, well, that would save, you know, me a lot of work for, you know, having to refinish, tear down and refinish the walls that would save the structural guy if he doesn't have to do that. And the end of this beam can just rest on the actual foundation wall. Like, wouldn't that be better if it could, if the weight just goes down to the foundations, which is strong enough and doesn't need to be reinforced. And like that would save us a chunk of money. So that's one change that I, I proposed back to them that they're looking into. Another thing is I said, hey guys, um, Back here right now, there's no beam now in the ceiling, like the current ceiling, like you can just see it, it's open here. And so I went back and I said, well, there's no beam here. And I think it's because the joists on this part of the house actually run back to front. So because this is a load bearing wall, they actually change direction, which makes sense because see up here, there's a bathroom. 
-hmm. So there's no pipes hanging down. There's no bulkheads under the ceiling here. So the pipes from the bathroom actually run down lengthwise in between the joists and they filter into the main stack, which is right here underneath all of this. And it goes down through the wall. And so I said, I'm pretty sure that the joists run this way. So I cut a hole through my ceiling. I finally did it. We're, you know, we're a couple weeks or months away from construction starting. And so I said, you know what? I'm just going to do it to get this point validated. And so they said, great. So that means this, there was a beam here in their drawings, which now I don't need anymore. So that's another win. Another win is that the fact that because that beam there was originally there and, and, and taking part of the supposed load, going into this uh, header that's over the door. Now this uh, steel header slash lintel might be able to be a slightly lower gauge and maybe might cost me a little bit less money. Don't know. Probably not though, or even if it does, then this beam now is taking a little bit more weight because it's also accounting for the weight of all the joists running that way. So this one will probably have to be beefed up from what they originally spec'd, but that's okay. So maybe that one's a net net, but still got rid of the actual cost of this beam. And that is important too. Um, and then the other thing that I discussed, I had the, um, at least one of the structural guys come in and he was just an amazing guy, lovely, lovely guy, lovely company. And so we had this amazing conversation about what else we could do to get the cost down for this, um, especially in this main area. So one of the things he suggested was actually keeping this beam because we need it. And then, and then instead of having this other cross beam, just ha making this beam one single long beam because what that would do basically is um, make it from having one beam, two beams, three beams down to just one. And he said the actual cost for both creation of the beams, because you have to do quite a bit of tooling and everything to make, to, you know, build them, the cost to make the beams and then install the beams is almost like three times as much to have because you're doing three beams instead of just one. So yes, the actual cost to the one beam would be a little bit more than the original beam being because it's shorter, but overall doing one long beam would be a lot more cost effective than doing three smaller beams. So we went back to the architect with that and we said, well, what about that? And she said she'd look into it. So that's another great thing. And then the final area of savings, which is um, really cool, and interesting is that is, is for upstairs. So this was my original um, drawing for the the new primary bedroom that we have. So it's switching the door around, coming in the side, and then um, in the new bathroom area, having sort of the, the the entry over here. Now, what this would require the old door, the old opening rather, the old wall came to about here. And so the problem is then when we shorten this wall from right about here to there, all of a sudden I need a new beam in because this, there's this recessed beam inside the ceiling, which I didn't account for. I thought maybe it would need to be replaced, but I was hoping not, but it, it would. So they've spec'd out a new beam. And so in order to save that, I said, well, why don't I just sort of reconfigure this space so that I can leave that piece of wall there so I don't need to replace that beam that's recessed inside the ceiling. And so I just built this little nook. So basically this is where the beam was gonna be, the new beam or technically the old beam that's there. And so instead of leaving that there, I just figured, well, let's just rearrange that. So I'll have this little bump out here instead, move the door over and then have this little extra space now as part of the inside of my bathroom and it'll just be, you know, storage of some form. It means my storage here gets to be a little bit smaller, but I think it's worth it uh, to basically not have to replace this beam and have more structural money go. So um, the combination of all those changes I'm hoping is going to result in some good savings, but I haven't gotten the revised quotes back. The, uh, the drawings are still with the um, a structural engineer. So they're validating that everything is fine and respecing out the details with the different beam sizes and moving that one away. So it's not resting on the window and, um, and then taking out this beam to account for this new little dipsy doodle storage area in my bathroom, which means that I can leave the existing structure. So they're scoping that out right now. And then I'm also, I've also given the go ahead to, um, the one structural guy to say, redo your estimate based on the assumptions that we're making about what the structural engineer is going to come back with. So he's working on that. And so I'm hoping to get everything back today. I was hoping to have it this morning, but of course 
no, no. So here's the video without it. And, um, and that is the update on structural, which is really exciting. So it's, um, I'm hoping, I am hoping that this actually gets me down quite close to my original budget. And you'll notice that really I haven't made any major changes. I haven't had to take anything out of my scope. I haven't had to, oh, oh my God, the one big, the other big, huge thing that I forgot to mention about the structure. And this is so critical. This is so critical that I, I can't believe I almost forgot to say this. You have to pay so much attention to the fleeting comments that people make on your job. So when I was originally talking to the architect about this, when I when I sat down with her and I reviewed the plans and I walked her through, because I of course gave her the drawings that I had done up in SketchUp. And I said, look, this is what I want. This is where I assume you're gonna need beams and stuff, but this is this is the drawing that I want. And she had said something in passing like, okay. And so, you know, assuming you'll probably want you know, recessed beams wherever possible. And I said, yeah, of course. Um, but you know, whatever. And then we, we kept on going. But that one comment is what drove the entire layout as she gave it back to me in the specifications. She was trying to make sure that the beams got recessed as much as possible. And that is why I had so many small beams being done and with the layout that it was because in order for the beams to be small enough that they could be mostly tucked up into the ceiling, they needed to be not that thick this way, right? They needed to be shorter and that way they would fit in the ceiling because I only have two by eights in, in the, in the, as floor joists. So that was the big concern. That was what she had put as the biggest uh, sort of requirement in the list. And so that's why the beams all got designed this way. And if I had said, just as a response, well, yeah, recessed is fine, but you know what? Budget is actually gonna be a much bigger decision. Then I may have not come back with this result that I had to then go back and change again. Because um, if I had said from the get-go that I would be okay with beams to just go underneath the walls or underneath, like underneath the floor joists instead of being recessed into the ceiling, the price I would have gotten back would have been vastly, vastly different. Um, or if I had said I'm fine with a partial, it would have been fine. And if I had said, like there's so many other things I could have said, but it wasn't, that conversation was not, was not, I didn't get that detail across very well. And that's a big learning for me is, is trying to say that up front because she just sort of said it in passing and I was like, yep, that's fine. Not sort of explaining, hey, if this works out to be, you know, really a lot more expensive, then I'd probably am gonna have to backtrack on that. At the same time, an architect is not responsible for other people's pricing, right? She cannot, and no architect can quote for another company. I have to harp on about this all the time because we expect architects to just be this solution that can put together a plan based on our budget. But A, a budget is arbitrary. I mean, I put 45,000 against it. Is that fair for the, the like the, for what I want for my house? I have not, no posts, no, no nothing, like open, is that fair? Probably not. It probably wasn't fair to begin with. Um, and so to ask an architect to, to basically prepare a, a project according to an arbitrary budget that other people have to then serve, like, you know, the stru it's a structural company who has to pr do the work. So how can they, how can an architect, one company, basically prepare a solution that is gonna cost something that another company is gonna also price. They can't do that, right? This is what I, I harp on about this all the time. They don't know, no architect can prepare a scope based on another company's budget or what you hope another company is gonna charge you. you they just don't work that way. So that's a big learning. Uh, and I really want you to keep in mind, and that's part of why I just insist that you do all of this yourself, right? You have to come up with your own drawings. You have to know the difference between, you know, pricing for recessed beams versus underneath beams. Like all of this stuff makes such a huge difference and only you're the one who can make those decisions for your home. Just like I'm the one making them for mine. And I'm the one who's accountable and looking through these drawings to say, hey, these joists don't run this way. Because if not, then I would, you know, that could have been in the job that, that, you know, the final price of the job and I, that would have been incorrect. You know, if I hadn't caught that this beam doesn't have to go, why does it have to go on a window of all the places instead of when the wall is one foot that way? Why couldn't it rest on the wall, right? These are things that 
are going to happen to you and you need to be accountable and find them and, and help craft solutions. And here's the other thing that I want to mention. When the structural guy was at my house and we're reviewing the plans and we're looking around and we're looking in the ceiling, we got the architect on the phone together on speakerphone. So we had a little three-way conversation and said, look, this is what we're thinking. Here's what you've drawn. Is there any reason why we can't do this and this and this? And she said, yeah, that, those are all great ideas. I will put it forward to the structural engineer, right? And so the structural guy was able to talk to the architect and have a like an actual tech conversation, right? Right there in front of me. And so we're all on the same page in the matter of one 10 minute phone call. And this is one of the strategies that I tell people, my students to do inside Renovation Planning Academy because it is so powerful. And the structural guy stood there and he said, wow, that was amazing. No homeowner has ever had me get on the phone with an architect, but that was really, really useful. I'm so glad we did that. And like the power of having a conversation, and this is what you can do when you're in charge. You can direct it, you can have the conversations, you get the people in the room who need to talk and you say, right, let's figure out a solution. You guys are equally accountable. If you want my money, you guys need to help craft this solution because I can't do it on my own, but I can get the right people in the room who can do it. And that, like, I just, I, I really hope that you can take this to heart and do something like this on your own and, and, and find a solution. So. I will have an update for you uh, next week on what the what the final budget comes in at and what the final plans look like, and I will share those with you. But I I just thought that was really really important and a huge a huge thing that I take away that I hope you can you can take from this because um, it's really cool and you're and when you're in charge you can make stuff happen and you can get budgets down by you know I'm hoping this comes down by thirty thousand dollars to actually get inside my budget. Um, so that I don't have to, re you know, say goodbye to more things like my skylights that I really want. I really want to have two skylights and I, I don't want to not have both of them so that I can have more money for structure that I won't actually see and get to enjoy, right? So, but the hard decisions must be made. So we're going to carry on. We're going to keep going. Um, this week, I'm hoping, like I said, I'm going to get the structural plans back get the structure sorted out and I want to get this contract signed so that I can book in the actual structure. It's looking like now it's going to be um, the first week or maybe the second week in June based on their availability. So we'll see about that for starting construction. And then I've got to work back from there to do demolition and stuff and then revise the whole schedule accordingly. Um, I've been looking at kitchens, so I'm hopefully going to book that in very soon. I think this week is going to be big for actually putting down deposits and, and booking stuff. I'm also talking to all of the electricians and plumbers this week. I have an HVAC guy coming tomorrow morning. It is all happening. So um, come back next week. I'm really gonna try and do an update next Monday. Hopefully my pink eye is gone by then, which of course I wake up with this morning and is no fun. It's one thing after another, but that's okay. We must carry on, mustn't we? All right, have a great week and I will see you next Monday.